You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. If you haven't heard of Axe Church before, we are a church in Camas, Washington. You can check us out at axecamas.org. You can see what we're about and what we're up to. We're glad you're listening today and hope you enjoy this sermon. Today is known as Palm Sunday. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that, except for those of you who are looking at the screen, which probably says Palm Sunday on it. Um, But this is the day, historically, that begins the week before Resurrection Sunday. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Today is, is Palm Sunday. It always works like that. Palm Sunday, the next Sunday is going to be Resurrection Sunday. This is the beginning of the week where Jesus comes into Jerusalem, where the Passover happens, where Jesus is crucified for us. That's the, that's, this marks the beginning of that week, okay? And, but the beginning of the week, we know what happens at the end of the week, Jesus is crucified. But the beginning of the week started much, much differently than the end of the week. And we're going to study uh, a portion of the life of Jesus today. And I love to, to study Jesus and, and hear about the things he did during his ministry. I even more love to study the things that he's going to do when he comes back, when he makes all things new. And that's, that's amazing stuff. But Jesus, uh, at this time, has been ministering at the Palm Sunday, the first Palm Sunday. He's been ministering for about three years. Okay? His ministry has been going on for about three years. But he has not had the people publicly proclaim him as the Messiah. Even though he's been going for three years, he's been constantly not having the people say he's the Messiah. It wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet. And so this is the day, Palm Sunday, this is the day that we celebrate what's called the triumphal entry, where Jesus will enter into Jerusalem as king. And so we're going to read the scripture in just a minute. Uh, But before that, I want to get ourselves properly sort of oriented uh, to what's going on here. I want you to sort of imagine, and and I want to set the scene for you. You have people coming into Jerusalem from all over the world for the Passover feast. Okay, This is the week of Passover, so people are pouring in to Jerusalem. There's tons and tons of people here. They're all making this pilgrimage to Jerusalem to be there at the temple and so on for the Passover feast. And so this, it's buzzing. It's buzzing. It's electric. There's a lot of things going on. At the same time, we have Jesus sort of in the culmination of his ministry. He's just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so there's a lot of excitement going on about that. And Jesus has done miracles. We've seen healings. His teaching has been powerful. This has been going on for three years all over the region. And people are looking and wondering, who is this? Is this the Messiah? Let's not forget that John the Baptist had already said, right? The one who's coming after me. So we know the way has been prepared. The, the energy is there. The excitement is there. It's, there's a lot of people looking for the idea that the Messiah is going to come and is going to set them free. In their minds, set them free from the Roman rule that they're under. But the Jewish leadership at this time are very opposed to Jesus, okay? They don't like the level of devotion that they see the people giving him. So the people have been showing more and more and more over this three-year period, more and more devotion to Jesus, more and more uh, lifting him up as a prophet, lifting him up as a leader. People whispering about maybe he's the Messiah. And the leaders of the Jewish people, they don't like that. Why? Because they don't want there to be somebody other than them, right? They don't want somebody to be other than them who's important, important in Jerusalem. And so this sort of sets a stage as we read the passage that we're going to read here in Matthew, and we're in chapter 21, if you have your Bibles, if not, it'll be up on the screen, and we're going to just read the first few verses. It says, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem. This triumphal entry is about to happen. But first, he sends two of his disciples to go find a donkey and her colt. And he tells them to just tell the people the Lord has need of them. I'm assuming that the owners of these animals were followers of Jesus, knew who he was. And so that when they said, hey, the Lord, they knew that they were talking about Jesus. And they understood that the disciples were getting this donkey and her colt for Jesus. But I don't know that. Uh, the, the question would be, why is he having them go get a donkey and her colt? Let's read the next two verses to find out. Verse 4 and 5, it says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there's a prophecy in the book of Zechariah. Okay? It's about the Messiah. 
And it says that he's going to ride on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here's the passage uh, from the New King James Version. This is Zechariah 9, 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this is what verse 6 says in Matthew. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Now that may seem like a, not that important of a verse, but that's an incredibly important verse. A couple things. First, this is what disciples of Jesus do. This is what Jesus' Jesus disciples do. They do what Jesus commands them. This is what we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, are to do. We're to do what Jesus commands us. Not to go take donkeys. Don't hear me wrong. I don't want you, I did what you said, pastor, and you got donkeys in the parking lot next week that you stole. Don't do that. But what he commands you to do, you are to do, okay? And, and, and here's another thing, the second thing. It's, it's very easy. This is one of those places where kind of the practicality, because you're just sort of reading through the story, right? And the practicality of what Jesus has just asked his disciples to do, to do is sort of lost, okay? He, goes to, he tells them to go and just take two animals and tell the people, oh, the Lord has need of them. Now, if I ask somebody to do that, I'm going to get some follow-up questions, Okay? If I say, just go down there, you're going to find you know, uh, two cars, take the two cars, and just, just say, David needs them, and, and they'll give them to you. I, I'm pretty sure they're going to say, well, have you worked this out beforehand? Are you sure that they're going to do that? Or what if they don't let us do the thing? I mean, that's what I would think. I wouldn't just want to go and take stuff, right? But, but here's the thing about these disciples. They, they know already from the years that they've been with Jesus, they know that he's good, right? They know that they can trust him that whatever he says, he's going to work it out. Even if it seems weird or strange to go take people's animals, he, they knew that they would not only find the, the colt and the, the mother and the, and the colt where he said they'd find him, but that the people would let them go and everything. They knew that before they ever got there because their trust and their faith in him was so strong. And we have to ask ourselves, do we trust Jesus when he commands us to do things? Do we trust Jesus when he commands us to do things? Because one of the things that Jesus commands us to do is to go and make disciples for him. It's a clear command. In fact, it's called the Great Commission. And yet sometimes I think, and I'm speaking for myself as well as some of you, that we would rather go steal someone's donkey than talk to our best friends about Jesus, even though it's a clear command from him. And if he's given us a clear command, then we can trust him. That when we do it and when we honor him, when we do what he said to do, he's going to work it out. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be what we think it's going to be. It just means that if he's called you to do it, he's going to make sure that you're in a good position to do it and that whatever's going to happen is going to be of his will. But we have to trust him more than our anxieties. We have to trust him more than we're worried about being nervous or embarrassed. We have to trust him that when he says go and make disciples for me, that we're supposed to go and make disciples for him. So, that's who we are in Christ, right? The scripture tells us what we're supposed to do. Do what Jesus commands. That's what his disciples did. They went out and did what he commanded. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread out their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. That's where we get the idea of Palm Sunday. Palm branches, okay? They're putting them on the road. They're waving them. They're doing this thing. We call it Palm Sunday for that reason. Uh, The disciples, they set their clothes on, and then they put Jesus on this colt. And then people, this great multitude, are cutting things down. They're throwing their their outer garments down on the road in front of Jesus. This is what you would do for a king, okay? And I'm not the math teacher. My wife does that. But a very great multitude, I think, means a lot. A lot of people, okay? Like I said, Jerusalem is buzzing. There's all kinds of people pouring into the city for this Passover week. And here they are on the side of the road, and and this starts up. And they start treating Jesus like a king who's coming in to the city. That's what they start to do, okay? All of these people. Josephus, the historian, Jewish historian, estimated one of the years there in the first century that the crowd at Passover, he estimated that over two and a half million people in Jerusalem, okay? That's a lot of people to be in one place at one time. So there are a lot of people. Now, what, did, what were they doing? Let's read 21.9. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
This is these people saying, this is the Messiah. This is the coming king. We actually have this, this uh, historical event in all four gospels. I'm going to read you what they said in all of them because they said there were people shouting this. There were people shouting other things. Let me read you all of them. This is from Mark. Then those who went before and those who followed out cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Luke mentions this. It says, this is 1938. It says, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And in the gospel of John we have, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. So this multitude of people, there's no mistake about what's going on here. No mistake. There's no way to, to think it's something else. They're saying, here is Jesus Christ, Christ, Messiah, the king coming in to his kingdom. That's what they're saying. They're hailing him as the Messiah. Now, you might ask yourself a couple of questions like, why is the Messiah, the king of the universe, riding on a colt, right? The foal of a donkey instead of a big horse or like a dinosaur, right? Or something like that. This is Jesus coming in. Why is he riding on the colt? A foal of a donkey. Well, um, actually, a couple of things. First of all, horses were not that common for normal uses like that. Generally, they were used for war, the horses that were around. And it was actually very normal and culturally acceptable for a king to ride in on a donkey. That was actually a culturally acceptable thing. Actually, a king who rode in on a horse, generally that meant war, that this king was making war. As were a king riding on a donkey meant peace suggested peace. And of course, Jesus is the prince of peace. And so there's a reason why he's humbly riding a donkey, signifying peace instead of war. He wasn't there to come and make war with the Romans. He was there to come and make peace between us and God. That's what he was there for. And there's symbolism here in that. Okay. He was there on his way to die for us, for our rebellious hearts, that we might be redeemed, that we might be right with him, that's what he was coming for. He wasn't coming to make war. Okay? He was a humble servant king. Now, for those who want to remain in rebellion to Jesus Christ, and listen closely, for those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ, for those who, who reject him and remain rebellious, there will come a time when he's coming on a horse. But I don't think you want to see that. Okay? If you want to read about that, you can go to Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11, and see how things go for those who end up seeing Jesus come on a horse. Um, because it doesn't work out really well for them. So what are the Jewish leaders thinking? I told you, they don't like Jesus, right? They don't like the idea of a Messiah. So what are they thinking? What are they saying as all these people are hailing Jesus as the Messiah, the coming king? We look to the gospel of Luke and we find this exchange. It says, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The Pharisees are telling Jesus to quiet down the crowd. Tell them to be quiet. Now, of course, the Pharisees could say, look, what we're really concerned about here, Jesus, is that it's going to look like a riot. It's going to look like we're trying to overthrow the Romans, something like that. They're going to get very upset. So it's just for safety. They could make that claim, except that nobody would believe that. First of all, like I said, he's riding on a donkey. There's no warlikeness in what's happening here, okay? The Romans aren't upset. What the Pharisees want is for Jesus to stop his disciples and the people from, from saying he's the Messiah because they don't want him to be the Messiah. They don't want him to be the Messiah. You'll remember during his ministry, he wasn't exactly having a lot of nice things to say about them and about the way they were doing things, about the way they were leading the people. So they did not want the return of the king. That's not what they wanted. Right now, they're the ones with power. They're the ones with power. They were the ones who the people came to and said, oh, rabbi, rabbi, tell me what I should do. Give me guidance. Give me counsel. Oh, I look up to you. They were the ones who walked around and felt like they were important. They don't want the Messiah to come and take that from them. They didn't like the notoriety that Jesus had. They certainly didn't like the fact that he was being hailed as a Messiah and they wanted him to stop the people. But this is what Jesus basically said. He basically said, listen, what you're asking me is impossible. It's impossible. This right now, right here, me going in in this triumphal entry to Jerusalem, this is happening. And if I told everybody to be quiet, the rocks would shout out because what God has proclaimed to happen here is happening. What you're asking is silly. It's ridiculous. 
It can't happen. And here's the thing. The Pharisees should have known that this was going to happen. Okay, this is, this is interesting. You're going to have to follow me closely through this section. But the Pharisees should have known what was going to happen, that the Messiah was going to come in to Jerusalem on this day. They should have known that the person who's riding into Jerusalem on this day, on the foal of a donkey, was the Messiah and the king. They should have known that. Now, why? Why should they know that? To answer that question, we've got to go into Scripture. We've got to look at some, some stuff, and we've got to do a little bit of math. I know that that sounds exciting, um, the math part, but we're going to do it, okay? So hundreds of years before Jesus was born, there was a prophet named Daniel. I have a brother named Daniel, not the same guy. Um, you've probably heard of this Daniel. He's the guy in the lion's den, right? That's the chap we're talking about here. Daniel in the lion's den, this guy, okay? This is back in the Old Testament. And in the book of Daniel, there's a prophecy that's delivered to Daniel by Gabriel, okay? And in it, it says this. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now, obviously you all know what all that means, right? Let's walk through that, okay? This is, this, what does this mean? There was a, there's a guy, there's a fellow. His name was Sir Robert Anderson. And Sir Robert Anderson was a, 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 a guy in England. He was in London. Um, and he, was, he wrote a book in 1894 called The Coming Prince, where he did all the math related to this prophecy, okay? And this is going to be really interesting stuff. He was the assistant, I think we have his picture. Um, he was the second assistant commissioner of crime for the London Metropolitan Police, okay? So he's actually kind of famous for the work he did there. He was an investigator and so on. And he was a writer on both uh, political and religious topics, okay? He was a very, very serious Christian. And Anderson was able to put together the puzzle of the 70 weeks in the prophecy of Daniel and come up to show that the day that they were, that they were, that this happened, the Pharisees should have been expecting the Messiah, okay? And we're going to walk through it. Let me break it down. First of all, we have to understand a couple of things. The periods of weeks we're talking about are periods of seven, okay? And they're seven years. Every week is seven years, okay? And if we do the math from the seven sevens and the 62 sevens, we come up with a total of 69 sevens, okay? 69 sevens. And of course, you all know that equals 483. You knew that off the top of your head, but I'll tell you anyway, okay? So there's going to be 483 years from the starting point that's mentioned until the Messiah comes, okay? Now, in order to know where we start, we got to know the starting point, right? Well, what did it say? It said this in the passage, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. When was the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem? Well, I'm going to tell you. We actually have this in Scripture also. If you go to the book of Nehemiah, you start in chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, okay? This is Nehemiah, okay? He is captive, right? And, and he's going to want to go rebuild Jerusalem. You can read the whole book and see what happens there. But it says, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. By the way, that was a very bad idea to be sad in the presence of a king. Back at that time, the king did not like that, and you could end up in really big trouble. Um, Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Like I said, if you look sad in front of the king, you should be afraid. And said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. 
Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Okay, that was a lot. But what's happened here is King Artaxerxes has given the decree, has written the letters, has given the command to rebuild Jerusalem. He's done this. Now, if you stay with me for a second, the edict to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem, to rebuild Jerusalem, went out on the first day of the month of Nisan. Now, how do I know it's the first day? Well, here's how I know. Because all it said was in the month of Nisan. But the way the Hebrews reckon in their tradition, calendar days, they would have given the date unless it was the first day. So if it just says in the month of X, it's always the first day of the month. So we know that the decree goes out on the first day of the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Well, we also know when King Artaxerxes ascended to the throne. It was in July of 465 B.C., Therefore, we have the date of the month of Nisan in the 20th year. Here's the date, March 14th, 445 BC. Okay, you with me? March 14th, 445 BC, this decree goes out and the clock starts on the 69 sevens before the Messiah will be revealed. The clock starts. All right. Now, these days were confirmed by Sir Robert Anderson at the British Royal Observatory. And you know that he has to be right because when people say things in a British accent, you just, it sounds like they're right, right? I mean, it's hard to argue with somebody with a British accent. They just sound really smart. So then he must've been right, okay? But we gotta do a little bit of math, okay? One of the things you have to understand is that they would have been using that the prophetic year would have been, the Hebrew year would have been 360 days. 360 days, not 365.2574, whatever. It would have been 360 days would have been the, the way that they were using this. And so we take the 483 years and we take 360 days and we end up with 173,880 days. I know you knew that. Under our current calendar, okay, that would be 476 years and 25 days. Now, if we do the math and we go from the date that the thing started and we go 173,880 days, that gives us a date of April 6th, 32 AD. What date was that? Palm Sunday. It was this day. So why would Sir Robert Anderson think that Palm Sunday happened in 32 AD? Well, there's another passage that we have in the book of Luke in chapter three that states that John the Baptist's ministry started um, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, which we know that the 15th year of Tiberius' reign would have begun on August 19th, 28 AD. We know that Jesus was baptized, we think from the passage that year. And so if he was sometime 28, 29 AD and three years of ministry, we have 32 AD as the year that this was likely to have happened, okay? Now, if Sir Robert Anderson is right, and remember, he's British, okay? Um, so he probably was. Then the Pharisees should have been able to know to the day, to the day, if they just would have looked and done the math and thought through it and done it, they should have been able to know to the day, the exact day that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a colt with the people saying, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They should have known that to the day. So for those of you who struggle with, with the Bible and with the prophecies and so on, this is pretty compelling stuff. Now, you can go and do the math for yourself if you like that kind of thing. I'm not a huge math guy, but if you want, you can go and you can do all the calculations. You can go use all these online calendars and look at moon phases and figure it all out. Okay, that's what these guys did. Um, but these, these prophecies, this prophecy existed hundreds of years before Christ. And yet, if we look at it, it actually pinpoints right when Jesus is going to walk in for his triumphal entry. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, rode into Jerusalem on the day he was always going to ride into Jerusalem. Okay? When the Pharisees are asking Jesus to tell his people to be quiet, they're asking something ridiculous. That's why Jesus says to them, if I told these people to stop, the rocks would cry out because this is happening. 
Because the things that God says are going to happen are going to happen. That's the facts. If God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Okay? This goes for every single promise in Scripture. This doesn't just go for the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. This doesn't just go for this or that. This goes for everything that God has said, including that he will return, that he will make all things new, that he will wipe every tear from your eye. That's a promise. It's happening. Cannot be stopped. Cannot be stopped. Everything that God has said is going to come to pass is going to come to pass. Okay? This includes that he loves you. He's promised that. It includes that he's working in the life of every Christ follower and transforming us into perfection. And he's going to bring that about because it says he is. It includes that he's always loved you. It includes that you're here today because he's drawing you into a relationship with him or deeper into a relationship with him because it's going to happen. It's going to happen because what God says is going to happen is going to happen. Now, the next couple of verses in Matthew 21, verses 10 and 11, it says this. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. It says the city was moved, okay? The word here denotes shaken like an earthquake, okay? Shaken. These people were agitated. They were shaken up, okay? The, the news was, was, this is the king, right? These people are treating this guy like a king. They're saying he's the Messiah. It has jacked up the Jewish population in Jerusalem who's here for this Passover. The king and the Messiah had come. That was the news, okay? Jesus goes in this week. He, he goes into the temple, cleans out the money changers, these guys who were taking, of course, all these people are coming from all over the world, right? And so if you live in this place or that place, you have different money, just like we do, right? We go to Honduras, we get different money. We, do, we exchange our money. They charge us something usually to exchange our money. Well, they were doing this in the temple. They're saying, you bring your money, we'll exchange it for temple money, and they were taking a profit, and they were basically, you know, oppressing these people. And so Jesus comes in, he sort of cleans houses. not the first time he's done this, because the temple is supposed to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. So he comes and he does that. He does teaching and preaching during this week. He heals people during this week. But what he does not do is he does not pick a fight with the Romans. He didn't start a fight with the Romans. In fact, he told the people, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. And by the end of the week, the crowds in Jerusalem were not yelling, Hosanna. They were yelling, crucify him. By the end of the week. Now, there are at least four ways in which the people in this, in this part of history reacted to Jesus and his coming. And there are at least four ways that we can react to Jesus. One of the ways is we can be like the Romans. Okay? The Romans, they mostly ignored Jesus. Okay? Until it became a problem for Pilate, until the Jews sort of forced him to do something here, until that became a problem, they pretty much just ignored Jesus. They were, they were in charge, remember? They were the conquering force. They didn't have a lot to worry about. They're doing their thing, and so they pretty much ignored him. And there are plenty of people who take that approach to Jesus and his claims today. Plenty of people. They don't deny it. They don't believe it. They just do their own thing. They don't care. They don't care. They, they put more thought into their drink order at Starbucks than they do into whether or not Jesus claiming to be God was true or false, whether or not he rose from the dead. More thought goes into their half-calf, doubles, blah, 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 whatever drink, okay? And, and that it sounds silly, but the truth is, is that that appears to be the way it is for some people. They simply do not care. They're so caught up in the cares of this world and their perceived needs or wants or desires and their screens and their whatever, right? All these things that are constantly vying for our attention and they're so concentrated on that that they miss the eternal. They don't even think about it. Too complicated. Too much to think about. They don't investigate. And they don't think they have a need for a savior right? So they don't seek one. Meanwhile, they're walking in a life that leads to death, and they're ignoring it the whole time. We all, we're all negligent sometimes. 
about some things. We let that thing go. We let this thing go. This is not something that you want to let go. This is not something that you want to let go. Don't be that way. If you are not sure about the truth claims of Jesus Christ, that's fine. Okay? Jesus made a lot of claims. He said he was God. He said he could save you from your sins. He said you were a sinner. He said you needed him. That's a lot of truth claims being made there. And if you're seeking after whether or not that's true, then you're doing well. Then you're doing good. Okay? But make sure that you prioritize the things that you think about so that the things that you think about, that you put your most time thinking in, are the things that are the most important things to think about. If you have not come to believe in Jesus Christ, then the most important, some of the most important questions on earth to you right now is, is there a God? Does God care? Does God love me? Do I have a plan and a purpose and value? Those are really, really important questions. They're much more important than most of the things that we fritter away our lives thinking and worrying about. They're much more important than the latest Netflix documentary, however much that may be saving the world from plastic bottles or whatever. Okay? That's the one I watched recently. Anyway, you, gotta, you can't be ignoring. You can't be letting it go to the side. You've got to press in. You've got to think. You've got to work it. You've got to prioritize the important questions and not say, I'll deal with that later. I'll think about that later for right now. I've got this going on. But I think that's how the Romans were in a lot of ways. But those questions I asked, is there a God? Does he care about me? Does he love me? Does he value me? Does he have a plan and a purpose for me? Scripture answers all those questions. Yes! Like all caps, yes, exclamation point, 10 thumbs up emojis, all the way. Yes, all those things are true. And there's really, really good reasons to believe that what Scripture says is true. I just gave you one of them, an incredible prophecy. I'd like to see anybody else do that. Okay? There's reasons to believe in God. And, we'll, and, and if you're interested and you're seeking, you're not a believer, you're not a Christ follower, you want to spend some time working through the evidence, man, you come to the right place. We love that. We love that here. So come to contemplate or make, a, make an appointment with me and let's talk through it. But spend the time necessary to let God reveal to you the truth about himself and the life that you can have in him. What could be more important than that? There was the way of the Pharisees. They didn't want a king. They were like Denethor. Now, there's two groups of people in this room right now. Those who know who Denethor is, who are nerds like me, and all the normal people who have not watched Lord of the Rings 18,000 times. Okay, Denethor is the steward of Gondor. Uh, that sounds so nerdy when I say it out loud. When I wrote it down, it wasn't as bad. He's the steward of Gondor and the Lord of the Rings. Um, I got to get to Comic-Con. Um, no offense if you go to Comic-Con. I really like Lord of the Rings. So, um, <laughs> so Denethor is the steward. This is the city of the king. He's the guy who's in charge. The king is not there. And Aragorn, the king, is returning. But Denethor is not interested in that at all. He's not interested in Aragorn returning. Denethor likes being in charge. He's not a faithful servant waiting for the return of his master, the king. He's a bitter man who wants to hold on to the power that he has. And the Pharisees look a lot like that. I can't speak to their hearts, but it sure looks like that. And we can be like that too. See, because we thought we were in charge of our own lives. Then you come into a place like this, right? And we start hearing that, no, 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 Jesus is the one who needs to be in charge. And we don't necessarily like that because we like being in charge. Sure, we are terrible at it, right? How's that working out for you? Not great probably, right? But we like it. We may want Jesus just to fix this thing so that we can go back to being in charge, right? And, and I know I've been there, right? Jesus, if you'll just do this for me, then of course you're in charge of everything. Oh, you did it? Oh, never mind. Uh, I, I know how that goes. I understand that, right? That's how we are sometimes. Sometimes we don't want a king. Even though we were made to be in relationship with him, sometimes we just want to be in charge of ourselves. We don't want the king coming in. But Jesus is a king, make no mistake. And he will be the king. He demands that we submit to him fully so that he can transform us into who we are fully. It's in our submission to Jesus Christ that we become fully us, that we become fully free. He's not going to accept anything less. So we can't be like Denethor or like the Pharisees. We have to welcome the king we have to love and follow the king and have him in our hearts fully. That's what we have to do. 
Now, after the Pharisees, there were probably many in the crowd who were looking for Jesus, the Messiah, to give them political freedom. They didn't like the Romans, okay? People don't tend to like conquering forces. It's just one of those things. And they didn't want to deal with being under Roman rule anymore. It's not what they wanted. They wanted national prominence again. They wanted the kingdom of God that the Messiah would bring, but they wanted it so that they could be back on top, right? At the end of the day, they were looking to have that worldly power, wealth, freedom, and so on, but Jesus didn't come to give them that this time. That's not what he came for. He didn't come to destroy Rome right now. He came to bring forgiveness, truth, redemption, peace with God, and spiritual life. That's what he's there for. He wasn't there to make them more comfortable. But they wanted their way. They wanted to win. They wanted the Romans out. That's what they wanted. And when that did not work out, they were no longer interested, which is why things were able to turn so quickly from the beginning of the week to the end of the week. But here's the deal. Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. He is not here to make you comfortable all the time. For those of you who have been following him for a long time, you can probably say amen to that. He is not here to make you comfortable all the time. Yes, there is great joy and pleasure in following Christ. But the point is not to be saved from discomfort. The point is to be saved from spiritual death and brought to spiritual life and to see that same thing happen for other people. That's the point. That's what he came for, okay? We can be tempted to want to have Jesus sort of perform for us. Do this thing that I want, right? We want Jesus to take care of the Romans, whatever that is in our life. Whatever it is that's in our way, whatever our problem is, we want Jesus to take care of that. And then when he doesn't, we're not very happy. And we're not so sure about this Messiah and King stuff in our lives. Because sometimes it's about what he can do for us presently, right now, right here. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not what it's always about. That's not what it's always about. See, we have to serve the King on his terms. Could it possibly be any other way? Not on our terms. Look, the time will come when Jesus will come and rule and reign, okay, and take care of all of that. That's going to happen. But right now, that's not where we are in terms of the way that things work. And right now, we got to go through some stuff, and there's a reason for it. And here's the thing. If he had come and took care of the Romans and ruled and reigned, there'd be nobody left for him to rule and reign because he would have died for our sins. And so all of us and our rebellious hearts, every one of them, every one of us, everyone that's ever lived, would not have had salvation. He could not come as the conquering ruler because first he had to make the sacrifice for peace, for us, for spiritual life. Had they, had they gotten what they wanted, we would all be done. We'd have no hope. He came for hope. He came for hope. We don't deserve his love or his forgiveness. Those are free gifts of grace that he gives us because he loves us, which is an amazingly hard thing to possibly imagine, knowing my own heart that God could love me, and yet he did. But had he come to destroy the Romans rather than to die for me, I would have been without hope. And sometimes the things that we want aren't necessarily the best things. Sometimes having Jesus do what we want, how we want, when we want, is maybe not a good idea. Thank God he doesn't always do that. If he had always given me what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, I would be more of a mess than I am right now. Think the world would be, it would be a mess, okay? Bad, bad news. That's not the way it works. And yet, I think there were people there that day that it was, be the king on my terms. I want you to come and take care of these Romans. That's my issue right now. I want to deal with these people. I want to be prominent. I want to, be, I want to, I want to have national prominence again. I want all these things. And Jesus didn't do that. And, and we can do the same thing. We can be the same way. So we must resist being that way. There's, there's another way to react, the fourth way to react, and that is simply to trust him. We don't know the plan but we can trust the king. We have to patiently wait. It's not the easy way. It's not the easy way, 
but we got to patiently wait. we got to continue to do all that he's commanded, just like the earlier verse, and they did what he commanded. That's what we got to do. And we got to continue to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and trust God for the rest. If we can live there, and the Lord has taught me a lot recently about what it means to trust him. But if you can live in that moment, I trust you, Lord, whatever you do, whatever happens, I trust you. Nope, you're not necessarily going to kill the Romans in my life. You're not going to get them out of here. That's not going to happen right now. Okay, fine. You're not going to do this thing I want. You're not going to do that thing I want. But I can hold on. And when everything else fails, I can sit there and I can hold on to my salvation, my redemption in Christ. The fact that eventually he is going to come. He is going to make all things new. He's going to wipe every tear from our eye. At the end of the story, we know and we can trust. Like I said, everything he says is going to happen. Is going to happen. So all these things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis, all the things they were dealing with on a day-to-day basis, they wanted Jesus to come and take care of. Listen, the most important thing has already been taken care of. He's already won. And we'll talk about that next week on Resurrection Sunday and what that means. But it's an amazing thing. Salvation is an amazing gift. And what Christ did on this week so many years ago is the reason why we're here And it's the reason why we can have hope and joy and love. And so we will continue to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, thanks for listening to our sermon. Again, this has been a sermon from Axe Church in Camas, Washington. We hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. If you did, you can subscribe to our channel as well as liking and commenting. We love to hear how these sermons are impacting you. You can also take a look at our podcast series that we have out and we'll catch you again next week.